I'm Gary Warburton, this is Luke Cascarini, uh, oral maxillofacial surgeon from London, and we're here to talk to you about the risks and complications of total joint replacement surgery for the temporomandibular joint. I think the thing from a patient's perspective I get asked most about would be where uh, are the cuts made, what do the scars look like, how painful will it be, when can I eat again, when will I feel normal again, will I have my hair shaved, Will I set off the sensors at the airport and will I look different? So the incisions are made, there's one in front of the ear, which is almost invisible, and then one in the upper neck, which is only really apparent if you look closely. Then in terms of pain and swelling, uh, patients do get a lot of swelling after the surgery. It's variable and it can be painful for a few days. Patients usually stay in hospital one or two nights for a single joint and possibly two or three nights for both joints replaced. The implants are very small and don't set off the sensors at the airport. A little bit of hair sometimes needs to be shaved but only really the fluffy bit as, as we say. Um, when will patients feel normal again? Well the full recovery process can take uh, six to twelve months but most people after two or three months feel feel near normal and are eating pretty normally, hopefully a lot better than they were before the surgery. The other question that we often get asked is, will these artificial joints, how long will they, will they last? And uh, the answer is we, we actually don't know because the custom joint that we most commonly use like this is metal and plastic, just like the knee and hip prostheses. But knee and hip prostheses have a, a lifespan due to wear and tear and they fail typically between 10 and 15 years so people will need a reoperation. This particular device for the TMJ has been in clinical use for almost 30 years now and we haven't seen that wear and tear failure rate. So it may just be that we haven't followed patients long enough but at le we can certainly say at least 30 years we haven't seen that wear and tear failure. So we can't promise patients that they're never going to need a reoperation. That brings me on to what's the most common cause for reoperation, and the number one cause is actually infection. It's less than 2% chance of infection, but if you do get infected, it actually requires at least two surgeries to clear the infection and then replace the device with a new device because the infected one has to be removed. The second cause for reoperation, less than 1% chance, is bony overgrowth around the components. Uh, which will require another surgery to go in and remove that bone and then maybe add a fat graft uh, to prevent it uh, recurring. And what are your views on patients who can develop an allergy to the components of the implant? <coughs> so allergy is, is possible. Most commonly the allergy occurs to nickel or chromium, um, which is an element of this metal device. This shiny portion at the top is, is actually metal or uh, is nickel or chromium. The, the, the majority of the large piece here is titanium, which people are, can be allergic to, but it's much less common. Uh, we can allergy test, so I always ask patients, do you have any signs of metal sensitivity to earrings or watches or jewelry? If a patient does have that, then we will be allergy testing patients to, to try and confirm what their allergy is. If it turns out that they are allergic to nickel and chromium, then we would make an all titanium device. Yeah. And then, of course, um, the facial nerve runs very close to the site of the surgery. Right. And it has to be, of course, <coughs> lifted out of the way if you come across it. And there's a, a risk it can be bruised or damaged in that process. Right, right. The most common branches, there are five branches of the facial nerve that cross over the temporomandibular joint. And the most common one that is affected due to stretching in surgery is the one that moves your lower lip. So some patients wake up about a third of patients roughly will wake up with some weakness in the lower lip. Um, most often that actually recovers and uh, that takes typically three months, four months, but it may take up to a year. It's rare that uh, it, it doesn't recover. Um, the other branches that lift the eyebrow, close the eye, they can also be affected but it's less likely. If someone does have a temporary nerve damage, do you use any techniques to make it less apparent? Um, we can use Botox, if they're yeah. lifting their eyebrow and one side is not lifting, yeah. we can use Botox on the opposite side to make it less obvious yeah. that there's a discrepancy between one side and the other. Yeah. 
Um, while we're talking about nerves, there are other nerves that are affected. What about numbness? Are there any areas of the face that will be numb after surgery? Yes, so some patients find that their lower lip can be numb after the surgery and the, the nerve that supplies the lower lip runs through the jaw and enters quite close to where the joint is removed and it can be bruised during that process. Sometimes the screws which hold the implant in can damage it theoretically and also sometimes if a patient develops some bleeding on the inside of the joint cavity the nerve before it's gone into the bone can be bruised and damaged then. So some numbness of the lip after surgery is not very uncommon. Yeah. What about the bite and, and the, the way the teeth meet together? Yes, so the, these implants are custom made and designed to restore the patient's correct occlusion, but occasionally it can feel a little bit different at first and we, during, this, during the surgery, do our best to uh, maintain an, a normal occlusion, but sometimes when patients wake up it feels very slightly different. Right. Sometimes we, we see patients that have got a very poor bite because of their joint disease and what tends to happen is the teeth drift and move to try and compensate. Mm. Uh, and if that's the case, which we, we know by taking impressions or scanning the teeth, and we know that ahead of time, if that's the case, sometimes patients require orthodontics either before or after surgery. But that's yeah. not that common. What about post-operative pain and uh, how long would that last? Well, the, the first few days, pain can be uh, usually well controlled in hospital, um, but we'd expect patients to be taking quite regular painkillers for a few weeks after surgery. It should expect it to be well controlled. There is a group of patients, especially those that had very severe pain from their TMJ from a long, for a long time before the surgery, that I sometimes ask to see a neurologist before I take them to theatre and sometimes use some neuromodulatory type drugs like gabapentin or pregabalin. And if they're started on those drugs before the surgery, they sometimes have better pain control afterwards. Yeah, sometimes the chronic pain patients may not get complete resolution of the pain yeah. because of the joint replacement. The joint replacement is prim primarily done for functional improvement and many times it will significantly improve or resolve the pain but in chronic mm. pain patients sometimes that, that isn't the case and they do require some type of pain management post-operatively. Yeah. The, the joint as well is just in front of the ear. The, another common thing that we hear from patients in the, in the post-operative period is their hearing is a little muffled because if you look at the model where the joint is, this is the joint and this hole here is the ear canal. So not only do you get swelling on the outside of your face, but you're also going to get swelling on the ear canal. And so that can reduce yeah. your hearing for a period of time until that swelling goes down, which again is usually a couple of months post-operatively. The ear symptoms can be quite unpredictable though. I've, sometimes patients actually have quite a lot of bad ear hearing problems and tinnitus and strange sounds in their ear before the surgery and joint replacement sometimes actually gives them quite a remarkable improvement. Yes, yes. Um, what about the, the screws? Do they ever come loose? Implant loosening is a risk. It's, um, it's rare. It can be related to the way the implant is positioned at the time of surgery. Theoretically, people who have quite low density bone, osteopenia or osteoporosis could be at higher risk of implant loosening. But that's quite rare, I think. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the very small percentage complications. The top two we've already mentioned for reoperation is infection and bony overgrowth. But yeah. um, loosening of the hardware or failure of the hardware, yeah. it can occur, but it's extremely unlikely. And it's yeah. a very, very small percentage, much less than 1%. Yeah. And then the other thing to be aware of, of course, is that a, a natural, healthy, normal joint has a very complicated uh, movement where it can hinge but also slide, whilst a, a joint replacement can only really hinge. So That's right. you don't get the same type of movement. You don't get that forward movement with an artificial joint. So if you have a, a single side done, you might find that your jaw deviates towards the replaced side when you open it. Which is fine. Mm. It's just some of the, we like to let patients know ahead of time that you may see that your jaw deviates and doesn't open nice and straight. It's fine. It's the range of motion that actually counts. And 
you know, the range of motion we hope will be more than 35 millimeters, but oftentimes we see more than 40. That's not uncommon. Luke, let me ask you, I mean, we both do a lot of these surgeries. Yeah. Um, what typically do, do patients ask you when they come and see you in a consultation? So other than the, um, the questions about scarring and infection, I think the other most important questions patients ask me really is how long will the surgery take? Am I any good? You know, how many of these do I do? What's my credibility as a surgeon? And, th and these are really important, intelligent questions because there's good evidence that uh, if you do the same operation regularly, you'll have better outcomes. Uh, we have a duty to keep track of our outcomes and be aware of what our individual complication rates are. There's no point coming to a surgeon and being told what the national complication rates are. I think as a patient, you should be able to ask a surgeon and say, well, how many infections do you get? How many of these operations do you do? How long does it take you to do the surgery? How does that compare with other people? And I think those are, those are important questions. And I don't think a surgeon should ever be anything other than pleased that a patient uh, asks those important questions. Right. One question that I often will hear is, can I talk to one of your patients that's had the surgery? Yeah. And in my practice, I'm quite happy to provide patients with uh, contacts and uh, patients that have had the surgery and then they can yeah. share their personal experience. Yeah, I, I think in TMJ surgery that works really well because quite often by the time the patients come to us, they've actually seen quite a lot of people that haven't That's right. really addressed the issue and they're quite keen often to make other people understand what a life-changing thing yeah. joint replacement can be. Yeah. I think we've covered most of the, the important surgical risks and complications that yeah. uh, patients need to know about ahead of time. Um, anesthesia risks are also uh, possible and the anesthetist or anesthesiologist will discuss with the patients um, those specific risks. Uh, and many times patients have questions of their own that are specific to their case. Yeah. And we're really quite happy to answer those uh, and talk at length about those um, at the pre-surgical visit.